Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the second session of our conference dedicated to the economic impact of the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Gulbinkin for organizing this very timely seminar. We have, as Miguel said in the beginning, we have a fantastic set of speakers. We have a gigantic topic. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. And so without much uh, uh, introductions, I will briefly introduce each of uh, our speakers. And then each of them will make a brief presentation, maximum of 10 minutes. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time for, for questions. So because this is such a gigantic topic, uh, I think we need to try to, to create some logic and some order, some sequence to the presentations. And so what I suggest is that we roughly go from the particular to the general, from the micro to the macro, a little bit from the national case, the specific national case of Portugal to the regional and global uh, aspects. So, uh, with that logic in mind, I propose that we start uh, with Susana Peralta. Susana will make a presentation on the specific policy response in Portugal in terms of support to families and businesses. Um, Susana is, of course, a professor at the Nova School of Business and Economics, where she focuses on the economics of multi-layered governments, which is very, very relevant uh, for the current crisis, of course. Our second speaker is Fernando Chandre, a professor at the University of Minho, where he leads the School of Management and Economics. Uh, Fernando also served as a Secretary of State for Home Affairs, which uh, of course gives him a very interesting policy background on this, on this crisis. Fernando will present a, a very recent, uh, a very interesting Vox EU column that he co-authored with many other uh, prominent economists on uh, the value chains in these times of disruption, what could be proposals to monitor those value chains and to correct problems uh, along, the, along them. We then have as our third speaker, David Levine from the European University Institute, where he serves as co-chair of the Department of Economics and has been coordinating the COVID-19 research stream at the European University Institute. David will make a presentation on topics such as a disconnect between policymakers and experts, where he sees an and, and he will talk about uh, what he sees as an excessive emphasis on borrowing money as a response to the crisis. Our fourth speaker is Ricardo Reyes. He will take us to the realm of central banks, discussing the different approaches of the Fed and the ECB. And he will also comment on the impact of the crisis in emerging markets. Ricardo is the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. Our final speaker, last but not least, is Alex Stubb, of course, the former Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in Finland, most recently Vice President of the European Investment Bank, who, of course, a critical institution for kickstarting the economy. And Alex's presentation will be precisely on the EU's response uh, and we very much look forward to it. So uh, let's go immediately to our first speaker and I will ask Susanna to unmute her mic and start. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Antonio. And I would like to thank the foundation and uh, all the organizers for the uh, for this very interesting conference and also for inviting me to take part in it. I'm going to start sharing the screen with you. So let's see if this works uh, with my slides. Okay. Okay, so now you should be all uh, seeing my slides. Uh, okay, so um, so these are just a few slides on uh, what I think would be the ideal uh, policy response to the virus to this crisis that was prompted by this virus, uh, and then uh, like benchmarking the Portuguese uh, response against that. What I think would be the ideal one. So, so I think it's very useful if we think uh, in terms of false positive versus sorry, my title is wrong, false positive versus false negative, not in terms of, you know, the disease, but in terms of uh, economic policy. So whenever we deploy a policy that is aimed at uh, helping families or firms going through, you know, hard times, um, usually you want to avoid uh, two types of, of errors, basically. One of them is that the people that are not in need uh, end up getting the support, this would be, you know, roughly a false positive. Uh, and you also want to avoid the false negatives. And these are the people that are in need and that for reasons that have to do with the design of the policy and sometimes with you know, social stigma and many things, information problems, many things that mediate the relationship between the social state and the families. Uh, that, so these people that are in need and actually end up not getting the support. 
Now, you know, in normal times, the support programs for funds and families are designed with lots of conditionality, lots of bureaucracy, and this is very important because it minimizes false positives. Um, and and in, in particular, one of one of the reasons why you have this very complicated, uh, you know, bureaucracy in design of social programs is that you want to avoid moral hazards in, the, in that, as in that people can decrease their activity or that they can conceal some part of their income in order to qualify for a support which, in, indeed, they should not be getting. Okay. Now, in this crisis, I think we should be really focusing a lot more on minimizing the false negatives. That is, making sure that the people or the firms that are truly in need do get the support. And it's, of course, achieved by making access to support as automatic as possible, little conditions, low bureaucracy. And I'm going to provide you with a benchmark, which I, you know, would I think would be one idea of a possible ideal policy. Um, okay, so the general idea is that, you know, we have this crisis that started almost overnight, that is very much uh, like uh, uh, contemporaneous in all, in all countries, so there, there are lots of multi multiplicative effects here that make it a very strong crisis. We have this abrupt fall in economic activity in some sectors. Uh, so there's a, there's limited, if any, room for more hazard, as in people are not really, you know, um, making uh, uh they're not really concealing their income you know chances are when you see someone that is that seems to be in need someone this someone could be a firm or a family uh that these people are actually in need so it's very unlikely they don't really have um ways to seek other income sources when the government has basically told them stay at home right so you don't need to worry a lot about more hazard. that's why i think this is a time in which the support policy should definitely be focusing way more on minimizing the false negatives than minimizing the false positives, which is what you do in general uh, when you are very much concerned about uh, model answers. Okay, so I'm going to give you this benchmark. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that this is um, that this is exactly what all the all the countries should do, but I think it's a very interesting benchmark. And actually, there's no country that is doing it. But I think it's a very usual benchmark because it, it really has these sort of ideal conditions uh, that I think would be the characteristics of an ideal support program. And then we can sort of, uh, you know, analyze what's been uh, done in Portugal, like using this as, as a benchmark. So this is a very small, like two page uh, paper that was written, it's more of a manifesto than a paper that was written by Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Sayes. And they call it keeping business alive, the government as buyer of last resort. So they have this idea that the government in, during the crisis uh, is, should be um, acting as a, as a buyer of last resort. So basically what they mean by buyer of last resort is that, that the government would just pay all firms and businesses to keep their turnout, by turnout I mean you know their sales volumes, so how much they sell, at pre-crisis levels. And this would ensure that the economy is sort of kept afloat during the crisis. And, you know, at some point when the crisis is over, everything goes back to normal. Okay. I mean, at, or at least everything goes back to normal as smoothly as possible, given the, the gigantic crisis that we are now uh, going through. So I, I should highlight that uh, when you look at the Spanish unemployment, so the number of people that registered for unemployment benefits in Spain in the past month, in the 2008 crisis, so, uh, in, so in the last month, we have 300,000 new unemployed people uh, in registered unemployed people uh, in Spain. In the 2008 crisis, that's the number of unemployed people that were uh, that that we reached after 100 days of crisis. So this gives you, I think, an idea about how strong and how abrupt and this this crisis, uh, you know, the sort of very strong and and quick shock that this crisis has. Uh, put on on the economic activity. So what what do I think is nice about this idea by Zuckman and Saez uh, as a benchmark? So first of all, there's no conditions except the most important one, no dismissal. So you are going to give all you know support the income of funds and businesses as long as they do not dismiss anyone, because otherwise of course it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, it's an automatic support. So in the sense that there's no there's no conditionality. You basically just make up for the lost turnout. Uh, it fully ensures, in the sense that it fully covers foregone business activity. Money is transferred and not lent, and I think this is a very important characteristic as well. It covers all possible shortages of economic activity from very little, you know, from a fund that lost, let's say, 5% of their sales to, to, to 100%, basically. 
Uh, and I think it's allowing for the convexification of the losses is something which I find very important. Uh, it's immediate, so there should be no delays in support. You basically would get to the end of this month of March and already start compensating the firms for their foregone uh, income. And it's a targeted policy. There's, there's no universal coverage. So you really target the policy to the, to the funds that need, and you target it as a function of how much they need. Okay, so against this benchmark, which again, I, I, I'm not saying that all the countries should be doing this. I just think that this set of characteristics is an, is an interesting one that would allow us to sort of uh, characterize the uh, different uh, stimulus packages that have been put forward in different countries and, uh, and to sort of see how far they fall from this, uh, uh, which I think is like an ideal standard. Uh, okay, so first of all, um, now let's go to Portugal. Of course, I'm not going to be totally exhaustive here, so there's, there's no way I could now go in just 10 minutes through all the, all the small, you know, uh, screens of the, uh, of the policies that have been deployed in Portugal, but I'm going just to highlight a few aspects that clearly bring them very far away from the ideal benchmark that I just uh, presented. Uh, okay, so for instance, when we let let's think about what Portugal has put in place for firms. So there's a there's a strong focus on short to medium run lending to firms, and the, this uh, this uh, lending programs are done with you know uh, comparably high spreads compared to the spreads that at least firms can nowadays uh, fund themselves. Although of course one could imagine that these spreads are not going to be maintained by the funds because of the crisis. However, it is the case that there's been funds uh, complaining about the fact that the, the cost of money that they have access to nowadays is lower than the cost of money of these uh, uh, lending programs that are supported by the government. Moreover, uh, these credit uh, programs, they, uh, they allow for a one to, you know, these uh, um, credits uh, that are actually uh, canalized by the bank between one and four year maturity, one and four years maturity. So that is likely to be very short in fact of the crisis that we are going to be focusing upon. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that you are focusing on lending is somehow supposing that the funds are, are going to be able to make up for the lost economic activity uh, in, the, in the near future is not totally likely, at least not in all sectors. So I think that's the problem. Um, so another another thing which is problematic with this program that has been designed by the government is that the funds also have positive net worth in order to qualify. Now it's important that we keep in mind that given you know the the given the, the universe of funds in Portugal, which is a country of very small funds, uh, this excludes around one fourth of all firms, which is of course very problematic because this is not the time in which you want to separate, so you really want to put put the support in the hands of the people you need it. You know, you can clean bad firms from the market after the crisis is over. And moreover, it's not even the case that all firms with uh, negative net worth are bad. They could just be growing. They could just be young. And that's particularly problematic in our case because lots of these new firms in the service and tourism sector, which are responsible for the recovery of the economic activity in Portugal in the last years, uh, are definitely ones of negative net worth. So they are unlikely to meet the criteria, so they're not going to be able to qualify for help. Now, if, when it comes to layoff, the government has also put in place a layoff uh, program, uh, meaning that the, that the uh, social security pays part of the wage of the workers that are temporarily laid off. It's limited to firms with at least 40% of foregone activity for a full month. So again, I think this is very, it's a, it's a big limitation. I mean, if a firm loses 20% of its activity, it's already a lot. So why are you excluding these firms uh, from support? Uh, for me, it doesn't make any sense. And it has to do with this, with this idea of, of convexification, which is one that I really like in uh, Gabriel Zuckman and the Emmanuel Fez, uh idea that you just compensate for whatever, you know, share of sales that you lost. If it's 10%, it's 10%, if it's 99%, then let's just compensate for 99%. Um, so there's another problem, which is uh, a bit uh, similar to the, to the, to the uh, credit problem, which is that funds pay wages and they are going to be reimbursed later by Social Security. Of course, so far, we still don't know when is Social Security going to be re going to reimbursed. We know that in Portugal, Social Security tends to be actually slow in reimbursing. Of course, we hope that now, given the circumstances, it's going to reimburse faster because otherwise funds are just going to put in a lot of liquidity 
that it is unclear that they can afford, uh, given the current state of affairs in the economic, uh, in, in the Portuguese economy. Uh, okay, so what about households? Uh, as far as households are, con are concerned, of course, the idea of the government is that the workers, that the that by going, you know, getting to the funds, the worker, the government would also um, to get the government would also get to workers. Okay, but of course, there are many workers that are, are not that do not have a formal uh, labor contract with funds uh, and indeed and here the government i think the, the the programs are also not ambitious enough so for instance independent workers uh the support is very is very uh, small so you, you, and it also depends on whether or not you have children uh, if no children and you only qualify for a very limited support which amounts to around 4400 euros a month and only if your activity is brought down to zero so again no idea of allowing people to just decrease a little bit their uh, level of activity. There's nothing uh, for informal workers, uh, and this is a problem because again, most of the, the the sectors that were most hit by this crisis are ones where you have lots of informality, and it's not. By, but by now, the government has been saying anything about how it plans to reach these workers, and there's no support for owner managers of small funds, even when they are wage earners and social security contributions. So there are many holes in the. There are many holes in the. It's like a net, but with lots of holes. Okay, in terms of size of stimulus, you know, Portugal has been very. The, the size is very limited. The government does not know anything between 26% of GDP. That of course falls short about what has been announced for other countries. Moreover, the government has already changed its policies, you know, the layoff policy, the income support to independent workers in very short time spans. And this, of course, is a problem because you really want to give trust to the people. So, again, the idea is to keep your economy afloat. If you start hesitating a lot, you know, that hampers trust and then I think it has a big economic cost. And the support is short in general. So I already told you that independent workers without children, they qualify for a maximum of 440 euros per month. But workers in layoff, for instance, they get half of their wage, uh, and again, kept. Okay, so I have another. I'm, 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 I'm. I'm uh, I wanted to discuss whether universal support would be an answer, but I'm, I'm stopping here. Thanks a lot, Antonio. Thanks for keeping me timely on this. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Very good presentation. So we'll pass on immediately to Fernando. Fernando, can you unmute your? Fernando, we cannot hear you. Can you can you check if your mic is muted or not? No. Could you try without her headphones, please? I think Fernando, if you if you don't mind, I'll pass on to David Levine now uh, while you try to to sort the your sound issues. Okay, can you hear me, Fernando? Yeah, I can hear you. It's okay, uh, so if you can speak louder, I think now we are we're hearing you. Are you not hearing me? But the sound is is on. Yes, speak louder, please. It's okay now. It's okay. Are you listening? Yeah. To me? Okay. Speak so loud. You can go ahead, Fernand. Speak louder, please. Okay, so uh, I'm going to organize my talk around three words, um, swiftness, uh, disruption, and coordination, or the need of coordination. Um, so this crisis has been really swift, really quick. Uh, the, the lockdown in China started in January, uh, by the end of January in China, and now uh, uh, by the end of March, it reached almost all, all of the world. Uh, so a lot of countries restricted mobility, um, both across countries and within within countries, uh, Europe has introduced the reinstated border controls, and uh, uh, this the, the swiftness the, the swiftness uh, with which these restrictions on mobility of people and also of uh, mobility of goods have been introduced has resulted in, in in very severe restrictions on production and distribution chains. Of course, the, the, the fact that a lot of workers are sick, uh, the, the quarantine policies, uh, the lockdown policies have also affected the production and distribution chains. 
uh, across all over the world. So in the beginning, we, we noticed that uh, when it first hit uh, China, uh, the US, Korea, Japan, uh, Germany were highly affected by the, the, the strong uh, um, impact on supply chains because a lot of components were coming from, from, from China. And of course, once you have this, this kind of, uh, of impact on production and distribution chains, uh, you have to, to be very careful because it's, it's not only about uh, uh, health-related uh, uh, products or protective equipment for, for, for health, uh, health workers. Uh, it's, also, it's also about a lot of very important uh, essential goods for households uh, that you have to be very careful because you know, even in just in Europe, just to have a, a, an idea, uh, the delay in 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 in, in crossing borders uh, increased by almost it, it almost doubled in just two weeks. So uh, by, by by today, it's like two hours compared to one hour uh, uh, on average, uh, like two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, what we have proposed in a, in a in a paper that was published in Vox CPR, as you, as Antonio mentioned in the beginning is that in this, in this situation where the production and distribution chains are affected uh, in a very random manner that is not uh, uh, predictable because the, the, the production and the distribution chain are affected by the virus and by policies that result on the spread of the virus, uh, you can have very important segments that are of the production and distribution chain that, that, that are affected. And so what we propose is that um, at the European level, at the national level, we should have some monitoring of, of at least for some uh, essential goods, uh, some monitoring of all the production chain and distribution chain to, to be sure that there are no interruptions, no bottle bottlenecks in the, in the supply of essential goods to, to households. So this should work uh, so this is uh, a bit uh, intrusive. So it's, it's, uh, it implies a lot of coordination. It, it implies that state has a, 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 a much um, a, a, a more intervention in, in the working of the, of the, of the economy. Uh, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned before, is, is that because the production, uh, the supply uh, is, is, is not uh, responding to prices because it, it's affected by supply side shocks like the, the disease of workers. We have to be sure that certain products are not, uh, the supply of certain goods are not, are not, are not interrupted. So what we, 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 we urge governments to do uh, at the national level and at European level is that we monitor the, 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 production, the, the production chain by using all the data that we have. So we live in a world that is very rich uh, in microdata. So we have a lot of data coming from national statistics, from the health system, from the tax authorities, from firms like retailers, from banks. So we have a lot of, of, of data, real-time data that can be used to monitor the, the economy and the, the possibility of these interruptions and to, um, to, to, to motivate policies, uh, measures by the governments to avoid the interruption in, in, the, in the production and distribution chain. This is, this is, in our view, this is very important. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is very important during the crisis. Uh, and we are seeing that. So you, you, th this problem is, um, is, is even more stringent because um, a lot of national economies are restraining the exports of some goods. So the, as uh, uh, you have, uh, so you, you have these all these problems that I just mentioned, and additionally you have some constraints on on the exporting of goods. So a lot of countries have been raising restrictions to to exports on medical goods and other type of goods that are essential to deal with this crisis, and and all the, the, this just makes the problem uh, worse. So this monitoring is very important to deal with the shock that we are facing now. And this, this is just happening now and it is going, to, going on in the, in, the, in the next few weeks, but it's also very important in our view to deal with the recovery. So what you have is that uh, it's, it all started in China. So it was the COVID con contagion and you had this supply chain contagion, but now it spread to, to all over the world and 
as China is going to recover, and some countries in Europe are talking about easing the lockdown measures that they have implemented, you are going to, to, to restart the economy. But as you have very important parts of the economy that, has, that, that, that are not working, they are just uh, locked down, they are, they are, they are just not, not functioning, uh, you have the, the high risk of uh, um, uh, reinfection of what is happening now, uh, for instance, in the United States and in some countries in Europe as Germany, that can uh, affect, uh, to have a feedback effect on China, uh, both in terms of disease and also in the supply chains. So also uh, at the international level, not only at the national level, not only at the European level, at the, interna and at the international level, to make sure that uh, uh, the recovery will uh, will take place uh, uh, once uh, the the lockdown policies are eased, uh, we must be sure that, uh, or we we have to do everything we can, uh, coordinating the policies of countries uh, such that the, the the trade between countries, in particular, uh, is resumed, uh, and that we can put back the supply chains working. Uh, Probably not as, as before, uh, probably in, 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 in different ways, but uh, uh, probably we, we, most likely we are going to have important changes in the way globalization is organized and the, the, all, all the world trade. But uh, to, to have a recovery, uh, let's say in the next uh, year, uh, in the next six months, we have to be sure that this kind of bottlenecks that we have in supply chains are uh, surpassed uh, because they are taken care by governments with uh, this type of uh, tools that fortunately we have now. So we have a lot of data. Uh, we have a lot of data uh, uh, for, for all the, the production and distribution process. And we, we should use that data to make the production and distribution process effective uh, uh, in order to, to, to make goods uh, to reach households and uh, workers to go back to factories because all the work in factories depend on the work of, of factories in other countries. So it's not, it's not going to be easy, be easy to recover uh, the, the recover. So the shock is different. The recession is very different uh, and the recovery is going to be very different too from previous crisis. Uh, Thank you very much, Fernando. That was a very uh, good summary of what is a complex proposal. Uh, so we'll now pass on to David Levine. I will ask David, please, to unmute his, uh, his mic and, and uh, start his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of points. There's a couple of points that I wanna hit. Um, one of the things that struck me most about this crisis is the extraordinary lack of connection between policymakers the people actually have the expertise to analyze policy. I've been amazed to see you know, Nobel Prize winning economists who are getting their data from the New York Times and publishing it on Facebook as a way of advising the government. Um, now, a group of experts have actually self-organized. I'm part of a group of economists and social scientists and other health experts um, who've actually organized ourselves to try to get proper data, try to communicate what proper data is needed try to analyze that data. Um, and I'll tell you what the focus of this effort is on in just a minute. But the fact is basically the only communication between sort of the professionals who study these things and policymakers that take decisions is through op-ed pieces. And that's a really crazy way to try to communicate complicated and difficult clients. There needs to be you know, much more direct consultation. It's not happening. Um, and it doesn't give me huge amounts of confidence in what's going to happen when the economy reopens. Next thing I would say is there's a lot of emphasis that's being placed on borrowing money and giving people money, uh, whether that's done through monetary policy or fiscal policy and so forth. Nobody doubts that there's a need for people who have been put out of work to provide, be given some sort of support. But it doesn't matter how much money you give people if nobody produces anything. So let's talk about stimulus plans as if somehow giving people money is going to stimulate the economy. That's actually pretty crazy talk. That if you send everybody home from work, it doesn't matter how much money you give them, um, nothing's going to be produced and nobody's going to consume anything. So it's important to understand that an important focus has to be on getting out of the immediate crisis and getting the economy restarted so that people are actually producing things again 
right? So that there's something to be purchased with all this money that's being given out or that people are able to earn or however they're able to come by those amounts of money. Um, I could talk a little bit about this whole issue of borrowing because there's a whole issue of euro bonds. I'm not that... I'm not that into this debate because I don't think it's really that crucial exactly how money gets borrowed or who, who borrows it. But there are a set of issues that seem not to be addressed in this whole thing, which is what is the commitment level of the joint governments that are going to issue joint bonds and money back? So, you know, what do you say when Italy goes out immediately as soon as there's a crisis and the first thing that they do is to nationalize Alitalia, the airline? And what do you say when the leading politician in Italy is Salvini, who says, as soon as this crisis is over, we get out of the EU and renege on all our debts? None of these things are an encouragement for people to support Italy. So if there's going to be EU cooperation, there has to be commitments on the parts of individual governments that they will do their share in recovery, not just take money as is needed in the crisis and then say bye-bye as soon as the crisis is over. Um, I want to say another word. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of silliness out there in the United States, for example. They're actually paying people more money to stay home in some cases than to work. So we should understand. I would say that if the government orders people to stay home or orders businesses to close, there's an obligation to compensate those people, whether they're legal or illegal or under the table or above the table or immigrants or citizens or whoever they might be, to compensate them for the income that they've lost because they are doing their duty to prevent, to protect public health. If you're going to ask people to do things to protect the public health and if it's costly to them, it seems to me that there's an obligation to support them. So, um, th this issue of who gets paid, I think it's an important issue, but I think it ought to be understood not merely as some kind of charity, but as an absolute obligation. As an obligation towards business owners whose businesses are closed, it's an obligation towards individual people who are ordered to remain home. On the other hand, we need people to work. We need people to work now. We need people in grocery stores to work. We need people to deliver all the food and so forth that goes into grocery stores, and we need those particular production chains to remain open, okay? We also need eventually to get everybody back to work, right? And that means some people are going to have to take more risks than other people. So people today, being a grocery store clerk is a dangerous occupation, which it wasn't a month ago. It certainly wasn't two months ago. And there has to be some recognition that people that bear the risk have to get compensation for bearing that risk. So it's not just a matter of paying money people money to stay home to do their civic duty, but it's a matter of paying people to take the risk more for the risk to compensate them for the extra risk that they take. You, know, you have people demanding to stay home because they're scared. Who can blame them, right? There's strikes in Italy because people don't want to go to work because they're scared to go to work, right? And if people are going to go to work, they ought to, first of all, get more for going to work than staying at home. And if they take risks, they need to be compensated for those risks. So these are things, I don't hear a great deal of discussion of these things. Um, now, I will go, I'm going to make a couple, I'm going to take, take a couple of more observations about this. Um, so I, I would say, actually, there's another issue that I think is a particular European issue, and that's the issue of regulation. As the economy reopens and after the economy reopens, the economy is going to be structured in a very different way. And with all due respect to Fernando, we are not going to centrally plan our way out of this by having the government study micro data and tell people how to do their supply chains. We're going to have to have the government provide incentives to people. These supply chains were never organized by the government in the first place. The government, you, I, Fernando, all the economists in the world don't have the data and don't have the confidence to reorganize all the world's supply chains. We have to provide the private sector with incentives and we have to let them organize it themselves. Um, so the need for decentralization and recovery is a very important one. But the other element is there has to be a lot of restructuring. The tourism, the hospitality industry is not going to recover very quickly, or at least it's very difficult to see how that could possibly happen, right? Hotels, restaurants, things surrounding tourism are going to take a while before they're back. Transportation, airlines, that means people need to move into other occupations, at least in the short run. And in Europe, the labor markets are very rigid. It's 
very difficult. So we have here in Italy, in Florence, there's not enough capacity to deliver groceries to people's homes, while you have taxi drivers sitting reading novels in their taxis because nobody's taking taxis. That's the kind of thing you see, kind of lack of coordination. That comes about because of regulation. And there needs to at least be some short-term recognition by governments that they need to relax the hand of bureaucracy and regulation enough to get people to be reallocated, at least on a short-term basis, from what they were doing, which is no longer needed, to what they should be doing, which is what is needed. Okay, last couple of observations. So I was... I'm, I, I, one of the questions I was asked to address is what will be the one policy response to reopening the economy. So I'm, I'm gonna to say to me, the really big question isn't, it's important to support people in the short term, but at the end of the day, we've gotta get people back to work and get the economy going again. If we just keep the economy locked down for the next six months, then we don't really need to worry about supporting people because we're all gonna starve anyway. So we need to get things going again at some point. To me, that's an important problem. This group that I'm involved with is working very hard and trying to understand how economies can be reopened safely once the infection rate falls low enough. We have not such a bad idea how to do that because Taiwan and South Korea have been pretty effective at this. You say, what's the one policy? The one policy we test everybody every day, but we can't do that, it's not feasible. And because we can't test everybody every day, we can't have some simple, straightforward policy. We have to test some people. We can't test everybody. So we need to know who's most at risk, who's most likely to spread infection. And we need to be now, now, not after the economy rules, we need now to be gathering the data to be able to understand where are the areas where there are risks and where are the areas where testing is needed. That's not being done. Okay, it's not being done by governments. It's not being done by anybody. We're trying to do it, but it's very difficult without any cooperation whatsoever from political authorities. Um, so I, you know, we maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe there'll be a medical breakthrough. Maybe there'll be a vaccine. In a few countries, they're relatively well run. Within Europe, Czechia has been doing a pretty good job. Germany has been doing a pretty good job. Outside of Europe, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan have managed to do things pretty well. China mucked up pretty badly at the beginning, but they seem to have gotten themselves somewhat back on course. I'm not so optimistic about places like Spain and Italy, uh, about the UK and about the United States. There doesn't seem to have been handled very well in the first place, and there doesn't seem to be any planning for the next stage. And I can see where this is going to be very, very problematic over the next couple of months. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, you, thank you for bringing topics that, as you rightly say, are not very much in the, in the agenda. Uh, I will now pass on to Ricardo Reis, who, as I said in the beginning, will uh, focus on the role of central banks, the differences between the Fed and the ECB, and also on the impact of the crisis in the emerging markets. Ricardo, may I ask you to unmute and-, and I already you? have. Can you see my screen or not? We can. You can. Perfect. Okay, great. So, so thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to uh, take part in this debate. The foundation is always just a remarkable place for um, the debate of ideas, and this is not an exception, and especially the health panel before was really quite, um, quite informative and useful, and so let me try to live up to that. Um, my mandate for this, um, for my intervention, was to talk about, and as a compliment to the other speakers, to talk about the role of monetary policy during this crisis, and in particular, what I'm going to do is try to compare a little bit what the ECB has done with what the Fed has done. The Fed, simply because it offers a benchmark, we could do the Bank of England. If people are asking questions, I'm happy to do that too. But especially to prevent also a certain view, which is one, a generalized view that, well, the central bank can always print money, get us magically out of crisis by waving its magical monetary wand. And two, a very European myth, which is that, well, as long as Lagarde imitates Draghi and says, whatever it takes, all problems magically disappear somehow. And it's all about whether she said the right thing or not. And neither of those are obviously correct. But I think thinking through exactly what is it the central bank did, what it can do and what it cannot do is useful, if nothing else, to stop at those myths, much like in the health session before us, there were some good debunking of some obvious myths that if you have basic knowledge of biology, shouldn't be going around. So let me start with that um, role of monetary policy. First, a central bank in normal times has a target for inflation, its goal to stabilize prices. During these times, that is not the focus. That has not been the focus of the ECB, the Fed, or any central bank I know, and rightly so. 
First of all, because measuring inflation in these months is an almost impossible task. At currently in our economy, we're, we're seeing some prices of some goods jumping up extremely, others falling, and for many, almost no transactions. An accurate measurement of inflation this month is essentially an impossible task insofar as that measure will be contaminated by all these big changes relative prices that do not reflect the underlying trend in the absolute price level. Therefore, ignoring the inflation data for these couple of two or three months um, when we're living in lockdown, and in many ways, the price system is in itself not working for you. We live closer right now to a rational economy than to a market economy is the right thing to do in many ways. At the same time, um, if while that is not the focus and that in a certain sense, the monetary policy of the ECB or, has not mentioned prices, and I think rightly so, that is not the case as well, that inflation is not ultimately the goal of the central bank and thus one of its concerns. In particular, right now, when the central, when central banks and ECB have massively increased the size of their balance sheets, how by issuing reserves, by borrowing from banks, while giving the banks that extra money, if you want, that allows them to fund, they've been doing so to buy a series of special government bonds on both sides of the Atlantic. Insofar as those bonds get repaid, then this in itself will not generate long-run inflation. The big question for whether inflation is in the horizon over the next two, five, or 10 years is whether governments will then say, well, central bank, you rightly indeed uh, issued money now to buy our debt. We will no longer pay you. If that is the case, then we will have inflation. But if it's not, we won't. And the central banks are fine to be expanding their balance sheet um, if they believe that that's not the case. But it may not be. But that's the discussion that we have to have in terms of inflation not one of looking at the immediate numbers. Second, second role of monetary policy traditionally is to be the lender of last resort. As the name indicates, last resort. In usual terms, central banks don't lend money to banks, or they do so in relatively marginal terms as a way of conducting operations, but not as their main goal. In a situation like today, though, it is precisely the role of the central bank. This is why the Federal Reserve was created in the first place 105 years ago. And this is why an ECB or any central banks, the role they perform is to lend, um, uh, is to, lend to the fact that many investment, many industry, in many industries, we have long-term investments. We have projects that have been started. They were being funded with um, funding from different sources, from the private sector, but with a great maturity disconnect between those investments and that funding. And in a situation of crisis like this, people are running for their funding. Those that were lending short term are withdrawing their funds. And you may end up with enormous economic destruction from terminating of those uh, long-term projects. The central bank plays a role and has played a role here. The ECB has lent, has lent in very large, essentially unlimited amount to banks. This was not difficult to achieve since we're already living in the conditions that allowed for this. But it has gone further insofar as by expanding its corporate bond purchase program, it is lent directly to large companies. And secondly, through its TLTRO program, which is nothing but a scheme whereby the ECB lends to the banks an interest rate and says, if you now lend this money to firms, we will pay you more than you would if you deposit with us, which is to say the fact that banks are being subsidized to lend and therefore using banks to lend to small companies. So then the last resort has been accomplished. It's been accomplished remarkably effectively uh, perhaps too effectively insofar as the, the long run dangers will be. And what are those dangers? The first danger is, and by the way, at the Federal Reserve, similar to this has happened, the Fed as of last week was by law forbidden from lending to any companies. The Fed could only lend to federal institutions in, or, or could only buy gov government assets or government backed assets. As of the recent, with the, chain, with the stimulus act that passed Congress last week, the Federal Reserve now is less constrained than the ECB is. The Federal Reserve could literally now, according to the law, lend directly to a company, not buy its bonds, but actually make loans to the companies. Now, dangers of this, and immediately the Fed is a good example for that, the independence. The Fed's independence in many ways was lost last week. The Federal Reserve right now, following again the new law that in some ways overcame and superseded the Federal Reserve Act, Congress gave it a chunk of money and said that for you to lend, you can lend now to companies, but this comes with strings attached in terms of what Congress says that the Fed can lend to or not. So the fact Congress is dictating some of the lending programs of the Fed 
in some ways. This is still, of course, going to be sorted out in practice, but at least that happened as of just a few days ago. For the respect ECB, that has not happened. The ECB has retained its independence. But like the Fed, when the ECB goes and lends to large companies and small companies, not just sovereigns, the amount of credit risk increases. That is, some of those debts will simply not be repaid. When they don't get repaid, we go back to my first bullet point, which is who will cover the losses of the ECB? Will it cover itself? And if so, will it have to print money, generate inflation to pay so, or will it not? That is the danger that, that, has, been, that has been taken. Third role of monetary policy. Monetary policy is always a fiscal agent and always provides some fiscal support. The key intervention here by the ECB was to extend by another 120 billion its asset purchase program and to create this new program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, with 750 billion euros, an enormous amount where in these two programs, which noticeably the ECB can use to buy essentially the sovereign assets of any uh, of its countries with any, no limitation. The ECB can now buy Greek debt, it didn't used to be able to, can buy Italian debt in whatever percentage that it wants to, and in doing so to stabilize those markets. Again, very important. In this way, if anything, slightly more modest than the Fed. The Fed over the last month and a half has been, or not month and a half, sorry, over the last three weeks, has been the market maker in the treasuries market. The Fed has at a daily rate bought more treasuries issued by the, by the, uh, by the, by the treasury in the US than it did at a monthly rate at the peak of QE. It's remarkable how the Fed has essentially bought an enormous amount of government debt in the treasury market in the last two weeks. So has the, EC the ECB has said that it will buy it, but actually over the last week, what's been surprising and interesting about the data is how actually there's been very large issuances by uh, many of the debt management offices, including the Portuguese one, and yet there's been a lot of private appetite to buy them. Um, so as of now, the ECB has not had to use much of this gunpowder that it created. Having said that, um, there are limits to this, and it's important also to understand those limits. Um, there's a simple arithmetic that is a little scary, and I don't want to scare you, but it's important to keep in mind when we now speak, just like Susanna was saying, well, let's spend a lot, and there's good arguments for doing so or not. And David, I think, touched this a little bit. Right now, the estimates are roughly every month of lockdown costs us approximately 3% of GDP. Different numbers, somewhere between two and four, let's use 3%. All of these fiscal measures are costing us approximately the same amount as a GDP loss. That is, it's costing us roughly 3% of GDP in fiscal spending in these measures. That means that if for every month of lockdown, debt to GDP is going up by 6%. So that means that if we are down for three, four months in perfect lockdown, Let's include some transitory lockdown. And let's say that some of the GDP recovers. Let's not say that all this loss is permanent. It is very easy to guess that debt to GDP in most European countries is going to increase by something like, by the end of this year, something like, let's say, 10 to 25% of GDP easily. That's a lot of debt. There's only so much that the ECB can do. There's only so much that a private sector that has little output that's trying itself to smooth that is going to be able to finance this. And so there are limits to how much of this it can do. Yes, let's buy of last resort, but very soon we're going to start doing this fiscal arithmetics of figuring out how much it was, and the numbers can get scary very, very quickly. Fourth role of monetary policy in a central bank, to be the macro prudential financial regulator. Here, there, here DCB is very limited in what it can do insofar as it's the national central banks and different financial regulators that can play a role. And here there are two important, uh, two important dimensions. First is the debt moratoriums. It's telling people you only need to pay your debt in six months, all debts get delayed for six months and interest gets forgiven right? and with no interest charge. In many ways, these are the right policies when it comes to the economics or to the productive capacity falling along the lines of some of the things that Fernando was saying or Susanna was saying. But it is important to note that these put enormous strains on the banking sector. In the same way that we're saying that the state must now serve as a lender to the private sector, so does the banks are part of the private sector that is, would be asked of debt moratoriums to provide that credit, credit which some of them don't have. Now, of course, this then becomes complementary to the lending role of the central bank, but it is using banks right now as opposed to public institutions. And so myself, I propose using instead for some of these roles, the European Investment Bank, or the public institutions, because using private banks is very dangerous in terms of the effort that you require of them. Second, the capital of banks. Um, 
it is, we learned from the last financial crisis, but we knew it even before that when the capital of banks gets depleted, we have inevitably credit crunches and difficulties. Therefore, many countries, and especially in Europe, have started adopting, uh, and regulators, forbidding banks from, through regulation, paying dividends and depleting their capital stock. That hasn't happened in the US. I think that's going to be a huge problem for the US. If anything, the Fed has actually encouraged, through its policies, banks to pay more dividends. That's actually a consequence of the measures adopted in the last two weeks. And that's, I think, an important issue that will come up. And here, I think the ECB has been, in some ways, ahead of the curve relative to the Fed in some way. Finally, the role of the euro. The Fed has been extremely aggressive in protecting the dominance of the dollar. It did so through the so-called central bank swap lines, lending dollars, as many as were needed, even as people wanted to terminate the dollar investments. And it did so even more extraordinarily in the last few days, just less than a week ago, by telling people, by telling all of those emerging markets that are holding all of this government debt from the US and were ready to start dumping it, by telling them, no, do not sell your treasuries, don't worry, I'll just lend you against those treasuries to prevent you from selling those treasuries. So the role of the Fed aggressively keeping the dominance of the dollar, keeping the trust in the dollar, telling people not to sell dollar debt has been remarkable. DCB, by comparison, has been much more modest, more modest in, its, in preserving the euro in that sense. But, and here, I will conclude here, again, falling on my mandate of also ending with some emerging markets. For the emerging markets, the crisis is really becoming a perfect storm. I mean, this crisis started in China three months ago, and I think people in Europe and in the US didn't pay as much attention as they should. Right now, we're paying a lot of attention, of course, to Europe and the US, but paying attention to Africa or Latin America or other emerging markets is going to be vital now because in, in just a few weeks, perhaps months, we're going to have an enormous crisis there. And the reason is that there, it's a really a perfect storm. First, the decline in capital flows as all the investors in the advanced economies are withdrawing their investments from those countries to bring their savings back home given the big shock of the crisis. The size of the capital outflow from the EMs in the last uh, month has been already three times bigger than it was during the 2008 crisis. Second, the contraction in external demand for their goods that falls inevitably from the world recession. Third, the appreciation of the dollar result again of the very aggressive Fed in Fed, uh, Fed actions to preserve the dominance of the dollar have meant that with the appreciation of the dollar, as usual, that hurts those emerging economies very much since they have many of their debts in dollars. Fourth, the fall in the terms of trade as the oil price war and the general fall in the price of, com of commodities has lowered the price in terms of trade. And fifth, the fact that as every country rushes to buy the emergency measures, ventilators or masks, the emerging economies are often left at the end of the queue in getting those, making us feel very worried about what the health concerns will be in those countries. The combination of those leads me to be very fearful of what will happen in those countries and that the crisis will hit them in a particularly large extent. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. You managed to scare us even a, a little bit more than we are, but I think it was a, a brilliant uh, presentation of a very complex topic uh, of the differences uh, and kind of the macro scenario we're looking at. Um, I think with that, that leads us very nicely to, to our final presentation by, by Alex Tube, uh, who will precisely talk about, from the perspective of the European Union, what could be the policy response. We have a, a critical Eurogroup tomorrow, and so I look, we look forward to hearing uh, Alex's thoughts on, on that point and uh, the way forward. Thank you very much, Alex. Over to you, Alex. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, good late afternoon, early evening from uh, Finland. Uh, I thought I'd go through three things. One is to give you a state of play of where I see things going at the moment. Secondly, uh, the EU's reaction. And thirdly, what I think will be the outcome. Just by way of beginning, I, I have a feeling that, you know, we're very much in uncharted territory and, and all of us are trying to get our minds around what this virus means on many different levels, whether it's you know, personal, European, global, or economic. And one thing I do find um, rather amusing is that uh, our social media, media community seems suddenly to be full of experts on COVID-19 and the coronavirus. My approach will be much more humble and I will try to go back to my basics and, and and, and try to give you a sentiment of how I think politicians 
might be thinking and reacting at this situation. So first, the state of play. Now, point number one is that this is a complete, completely new situation for any uh, decision maker or politician at the helm, whether you come from an authoritarian dictatorship, whether you come from a democracy. Um, it, we should not compare it to anything that we've had previously. I was intimately involved with the financial crisis 2008 uh, to 2015, but it's nothing like it. It's not like the asylum crisis of 2015 either. It, it, it's completely new and it will have an impact on, on, on everything. Uh, secondly, I think what makes this so unique is that it, it touches every one of us. It has a global dimension. It has a regional dimension, it has a national dimension, it has a local dimension, and it has a personal dimension. It, it's one of those things where you really can't detach yourself from it, uh, no matter where you are in the world. And it's going to impact us in, in many different uh, ways. And that's what I think makes the global community uh, so much more aware of, of what is going on because the impact is so global and at the same time so personal. My final point on the state of play, and I, I really echo what the previous speaker said, is that it's quite simple from an economic perspective, that this will and has already hit growth uh, and value chains. Uh, this will and ha has already hit debt levels. Uh, and the types of packages that we'll see coming not only from European states, but more broadly and this will and has already hit unemployment whether in the united states skyrocketing uh, week after week in europe or anywhere else so the situation is very much an unknown uh, and that's why i think it's it's very useful to try to find solutions and i think david talked about the sort of disconnect between policymakers and uh, say academics um, I think it might exist, but I, I do think that the dialogue is actually more vibrant than it has been uh, ever before. And one of the reasons is that, you know, politicians take advice from civil servants and civil servants take advice or try to find concepts, say, from the world of academia and the transnational world. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, I think there's an interaction, whether it's through Facebook or, or anything else. And we need more of this interaction. Uh, my second point is the EU reaction. Now, what usually happens in the EU first is that every country goes native, right? Um, I mean, you start protecting your own, you go into this nationalistic mode of communication, whereby you say that, of course, we will help you out. You know, there'll be protective measures. We'll close borders. Uh, we even stop the free flow of goods. This is quite normal uh, in these types of, of situation. And that was what most European leaders did in the beginning. Uh, secondly, uh, another thing is bad communication. I mean, never underestimate the capacity of a European leader to bash Brussels and the European Union and then try to take credit themselves. It's just a classic situation. And we saw that in the beginning of the, the crisis as well and still going on a little bit. But then we come to the, the, the good news. And, and I mean, no matter how much you look at the detail, the message of the European Union at the moment and what we'll see coming out of the Eurogroup and ECOFIN and later the European Council is going to be a, a positive one. To me, there is a cocktail package of five measures that the European Union will take in one form or another. Uh, and they're well known to all of us and have been mentioned. The first one, the most important one, I think, was the ECB uh, PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, 750 billion euros. Uh, I think the second most important is actually what my former alma mater and employer is doing, the European Investment Bank with its credit guarantees. It came out very forcefully in the beginning, and that has an impact on the real economy and small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Thirdly, I think the, the European Commission is doing exactly what it can do with the instruments that it's, it's been given. So two days ago they launched, or a few days ago they launched, launched the SURE package. It's a sort of a commission employment fund of 100, 100 billion euros. I, I think the exact right move. Fourthly, uh, you have the ESM credit line coming out. 
And in the beginning, again, I come back to the communication. I mean, you know, some countries came out and said, we can't use that. It took them two or three days to just backtrack and say, well, of course we can, no problem. Uh, and then, of course, 50 leaders talk about, uh, you know, COVID or Corona fund, Corona bonds, uh, different types of credit lines. I think they're all quite welcome. And in, in my in my feeling is that now we're starting to see the European Union taking more and more uh, action. But hey, you know, let's be realistic. The way in which the European Union works is simply three phases. First, there is first there is a crisis. Then there is chaos. That's where we are right now. And finally, there is a suboptimal solution. You know, I mean, it's it, you know we, we want to draw these sort of highfalutin and wonderful models, but the truth is that the outcome is always going to be a bit sublime, and, and let's just live with it. My final and third point is then, you know, what is the sort of outcome, or what should we be looking at this? And here, I'm a bit more sort of global in my thinking than than European. The first thing is 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 a personal reflection. Uh, I think this will force uh, a change of behavioral pattern for all of us. I mean, look, I would have been glad to fly to Portugal this time of the year to, to participate in this conference, but look what we're doing. We're doing it over a teleconference from probably five or six cities. We're probably being listened to in 30 or 40 different countries. We're all sitting with our families in different rooms doing you know, schools or, or long distance working. Uh, it, it, it's simply changing the way in which we, we, we do things and probably towards a slightly more productive way. Uh, secondly, I think in terms of the European Union, it will take first one step back, but then again, two step forward. It's going to be like the financial crisis. You know, the European Union never wastes a good crisis. So, you know, when you have one of these things, the initial reaction is tough and a fight. And then at the end of the day, you come up with, with something which, which moves the EU forward. Globally and, and finally, I, I think we'll see a shift of balance again between state and market. Uh, so, you know, a little bit like after 9-11 and after the financial crisis, the state, state takes a slightly hold, stronger hold, unlike it did after the Cold War when the market started to rule. So we see a slight shift towards the state again, I think with the Corona one. Uh, secondly, globally, I think we will see a, a fight of hearts and minds between China, the United States and the European Union. Uh, and, and because the U.S., I'm a strong transatlanticist, trans because the U.S. has taken the America first policy, I think actually China, from a global perspective, will gain on this and Europe will be a good second. And finally, I do think that big tech is going to gain a lot on this and we already see that going on. I'll just leave you with a final thought. I think this debate started in every European, actually in every country in the world, uh, a little while back. It's, it's this debate about the economy versus the virus or you know, economic growth versus health and humans. And, and I think that this debate might be taking us in the wrong direction. You, know, you, you, you simply cannot put the price tag on a human life. And I, I do hope that, that we can sort of move away from that type of a debate and just look at the raw economic data and focus on that and then let governments take care of, of the containment of, of the virus. So these are my three points. First on the state of play, secondly, the EU reaction, and thirdly, uh, my thinking on the outcome. Thank you very much, Alex. That was uh, also very, very interesting and concise. Can I ask a, a short follow-up question for each of your participations and I'll take the, the inverse order. So I'll start with you, Alex. Um, Finland is always a very interesting country, a very interesting bellwether because it's very pro-European, but also somewhat fiscally conservative. If you were a Minister of Finance tomorrow, as you were in the past in the Eurogroup, what would be your one or two kind of proposals coming out of Finland? Uh, in terms of specific instruments? Well, it's easy for me to say now that I'm not in government anymore, but I would go full Monty. <laughs> in other words, I'll, I'd come out with the biggest solidarity language that you've heard from the Finnish finance minister in a long, long time. Uh, because I, I think this crisis is so different from the financial crisis. Then you probably had fairly or not the possibility to pinpoint and say, listen, guys, you didn't do that correctly in your economy. You, didn't, you know, you could always use that argument. And especially when you had to sell it to your taxpayers at home, you could do that. 
And um, don't forget that I was in government with the true Finns when I was finance minister. So, so my negotiating mandate was about that wide. Um, but nowadays, now I would go, I mean, I would basically surprise everyone, come in as a finance minister and, hey, say Finland is with you on this, whatever it takes, we're going to help out. Uh, but I think that every government tomorrow is simply going to have to do that. Thank you very much, Alex. Very clear. Ricardo, can I ask you, you, you talked very eloquently about this idea that the, the independence of the Federal Reserve could be in question because of the direct uh, purchases. Do you think that in Europe, a solution would be using the ESM as an intermediary? Do you think that uh, by using this proposal of, of the ESM um, as kind of the, the, the interface uh, could, could kind of solve this issue? It depends on what you mean by an intermediary. I mean, what I, starting with the central bank, it is the case that, and it's not unusual that in a circumstance like this, in very large, in every war that I know of, the central bank stops being independent. It becomes essentially a subject fiscal agent. And so it's not shocking that, uh, that that would happen this time around. Having said that, in the case of the ECB, that's much harder because there isn't really just a fiscal authority can step in and at the end writes a treasury Fed accord like happened in the US after World War II that we get, gives the independence back to the central bank and we go back to normal. So that's the first thing where the ECB is a little peculiar because it doesn't have a counterpart that's very easy for, to, from which to lose and then to especially regain its independence. Now, you asked about the ESM, though. Um, I think at this point, I think all the European institutions certainly have to be involved. And I think the question here is, to what extent uh, do we think that this being a common crisis that hits many and that the expenses associated with it, some of it should be shared by many, what is the right instrument with which to do so? Uh, and this goes to this discussion on bonds of different kinds and so on. I think there is an argument for some of the expenses to be shared because after all, let's just think about the free rider problem. I could say, well, I'm not gonna do anything about the epidemic in my country. And then given the first circulation of people let my people go and make everyone else get sick afterwards, even though all of you are doing lockdown and I'm not gonna do it in mine or so on. And I'll benefit my economy now, I'll infect all of you. So there's some argument for some of the expenses to be shared. Once you, once you accept that argument, and I'm not saying all of them, and I'm certainly not saying that this leads to euro bonds that leads for us to taking over past debts. Not at all. I'm just saying that some of this are for some of the expenses being taken. Okay. Once you do that, then what is the right institution to do so? Well, the ESM is certainly the one that seems particularly, uh, let's say, to already have the infrastructure to do it. It does have a problem, which is that the ESM only makes loans with conditionality and um, with a debt sustainability plan. And the sustainability plan right now is really an exercise in fake economics. Who knows whether that is sustainable? And the conditionality seems a little weird when the dispensers are direct for something. So I would prefer to have something like the European Investment Bank, which is much more targeted to a particular investment, okay. and this will be targeted to some expenses. Thanks to a lot, Ricardo. Thanks. Thank you very much. David, can I just ask you quickly? I mean, you, you touched on many, many complex subjects, but on the issue of, of getting people back to work safely, you said you were thinking about that issue, you were working on that issue. Uh, do you have some hope on some technological developments that could help accelerate that process? I don't think the issue is so much is so much technology. The, the, you know, we, we, know, we know things that have to be done. We know that people have to be kept at safe distances. Uh, we, need, we need to be able to enforce these things. We need to relax regulations so businesses can be open longer hours so they can handle customers or you know, don't have to pack customers in very densely. Um, but, but the kinds of things that we don't really know about is we just don't know what are the really important sources of infection. For example, we need to keep people off of buses because buses are a big source of infection. We have a pretty good idea that subways are a big source of infection. So there's, the problem is it's very difficult to get data on how people got infected. So we don't really understand the channels all that well. So what we did during the lockdown is we basically closed down all the possible channels. Great, that worked. The problem is to get the economy going, you're gonna to have to open up some of those channels again, and you need to know which are the least dangerous ones in order to do it in a sensible way to prevent reinfection and the disease from getting a foothold again. So we're in a bit, you know, we have some ideas. There is some data on this. There are some ideas about this, but you know, it's a bit of a flyby, flyby right. seat of the pants up. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, Fernando, may I just ask you, I mean, your proposal, you, you said rightly that there could be some concerns about 
the invasive nature of, of such a monitoring uh, scheme. Uh, have you thought a little bit about what controls could be in place to avoid uh, this kind of uh, overreach by, by this uh, cabinet and by the, this function of the government of monitoring the value chains? Very quickly, please. Well, I think at the European level, we have a very good uh, preservation of rights. So the European Union has been in the forefront of this protection of of uh, privacy of individuals. So I think that is a, a good starting point. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it will imply what David was saying about uh, having, having workers back to work. Of course, we need to know what is what is their health condition. So it, it implies some more data about, about their health. Uh, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to, to go out of this crisis without using all the data that we have. So market should be, according to our view, in the center of the resolution of the problems, but we have to make use of all the data that we have. That is really crucial. Uh, the, the, the objective is to identify bottlenecks, to make the goods flow across borders and to, to deliver to, to, to the households what they need. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, and to conclude, uh, Susanna, may I ask you, you, you talked about, you raised some criticisms about the Portuguese approach to helping families and, and uh, businesses. Would you um, have kind of a positive benchmark of a, of a country in Europe or elsewhere that you believe has been, has been kind of a good uh, case study in terms of support to households and families? Yeah, thanks a lot for the question, Antonia. I mean, to be honest, I think that uh, no, no country has actually done everything that, that that could be done in terms of supporting the families and the funds. And I, I totally agree with the speakers after me, including Ricardo, when he raised the point that, of course, the, the cost of these policies is very high. And that is particularly a problem in the Portuguese case because of our very big debt to the GDP ratio. Uh, and we, and, you know, it's, unlikely that, that the, the full uh, generosity that I have presented as a benchmark would be a good idea for the Portuguese economy without more support from the uh, European Union, okay? Um, so, right, but uh, having said that, you know, there's, there's been a lot more, for instance, the, the Spanish government, they, they said they put, they put in, uh, the Prime Minister Sanchez, he said that he was going to spend uh, something like 200 billion euros. That's, uh, that's, uh, that goes very close to 20% of the GDP, of the Spanish GDP. Um, and I think that's much, that these are much more generous uh, policies. What I see in Portugal as a problem, and, and for instance, if you take France, France has stopped all the bills like this. It's been, uh, it's suspended the payment of all the utility bills for all the firms which I think has a problem in terms of targeting. I think you should be targeting the support much more. Um, but, you know, it, that was something, that's something that is like automatic. As soon as you say that the utilities are not no longer going to be paid, then the firms have a, have a relief that, that get, gets this month already, okay? So I think there are many small examples that could be done. What I think is really problematic in the Portuguese uh, policies is that it leaves lots of holes, lots of very big holes in the safety net. Uh, and that's actually why the government has been changing them over and over again. So, uh, okay. and, so and, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, for those who are following us on Facebook and on YouTube, we'll have now a three minute uh, break. So please uh, hang around and then the, the third session will come in three to five minutes. So thank you very much to Gulbenkian. Thank you very much to the speakers who, uh, you know, with lots of constraints were able to join us today. We really appreciate you. And I think, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I think it was a very interesting debate and I hope to see you soon. And, and again, as Monica said, uh, stay safe and uh, hope all your families are well. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks.